<sighs> so good afternoon and welcome. I'd like to welcome everybody to our next uh, session here on Sacred Space and Talking Circles, uh, Convergence Room with World Unity Week. Um, and, and today we have um, Toward Healing, Racism and Social Justice. And our speakers are Clevia Von de Witz, Mutima Imani, and Ejna Fleury. Welcome, everybody. We're so pleased that you could be with us. And we're going to, um, got to get my cheat sheet open here. <laughs> so we're going to first just have. Uh, an opening prayer. I'm going to light. I'm going to light some sage, and I'm going to ask Mutima to do an opening prayer, and then we're going to introduce each of our uh, each of ourselves. So I'm lighting this sage for us, mm. Mutima. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Let us ground together. Let us get comfortable in our bodies and lower your eyes or close them if you will. Allow yourselves to come totally into your body for this important moment in time and this important conversation. Take a deep breath and allow all of your nervous system to settle Settling down, opening your heart, taking a deep breath in, letting go of any resistance. And let's make a unified energy field where we can all show up as individual expressions of this divine thing called life in this moment in time when it is so important to talk about justice. So great spirit, we are your servants. We know that as we learn and discover together, we can create and reimagine a world that is full of equity and justice. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mutima. And allow me to introduce myself. I am Ejna Fleury, and uh, my lineage is I'm an enrolled in South Dakota at the Crow Creek Sioux Reservation. It's um, one of several reservations in the state, and my mother comes from a different reservation, which allowed me to be related to many of, um, I think, all of the, the great Sioux Ocheti Sakawan. I also have some French blood, so I have European ancestry also. And I want to, in just a really brief introduction, because I'll say, say more things about myself in a little bit, and my sisters are going to introduce themselves. So Mutima will make her introduction. Mm. Mutima Imani is my name. I'm an African-American woman whose family were brought from Africa, enslaved in the United States. My mother's father was a Blackfoot Indian, part Blackfoot Indian, so I have some native blood too. Um, my father was in the service and so I traveled outside of the country for my first eight years. And um, so I've been in other cultures and I'm really happy to be here as a social justice, peacekeeper, restorative justice practitioner. Thank you. Clevia. So I'm, my name is Clevia von Davids. I'm very honored to be on this panel today. I have been working as a judge in Germany. I have interned at the Truth Commission in South Africa, and that has completely changed my perception of justice and the role of judges courts and how to move into a new direction so i'm looking very forward to our discussion thank you everyone for being here today with us thank you so 
part of what we enter this panel and this discussion and this sacred time together is that we know that our social and justice systems are, are broken. And we brought this whole topic into sacred space because there is not yet this recognition of this greater reality of the cosmos in which we live. And so we want to invite all dimensions of our being to be here because this is time. This is time for humanity for us to wake up to um, the span of our spirit, which spans all of our cultures and spans our beautiful earth. And so, and we're so, um, it was synchronicity that brought this all together. So we want to weave this and as we weave our discussions and we weave our histories that we know that we are learning how to work with spirit because we really don't know how that well yet to invite the numinous, the deep, the sacred to work with us because that is really what's going to help with bridging all these gaps that seem so formidable right now. So I'm going to begin uh, with the Native American perspective. We're kind of going to go historically. So I'll start because of being here on this, uh, this soil here. And then Mutima will uh, speak because of the diaspora from Africa. And then uh, Clivia will speak. And and we're going to try and span, you know, from the personal to the our uh, professional, and then into this greater perspective. And then after that, we will break into breakout sessions. So with that, I'm going to uh, ring the bell for starting this next session. Section. So I'm going to take this, um, this 15 minutes of my time to share the challenges, but also the strengths of what indigenous here on this continent and indigenous everywhere. Yes, yes, we're all indigenous of mother earth, but we're all born into these lineages and I think the challenge is for us to take each of these lineages that we're talking about and what some of the lessons are because they're different. They are, there's some of them there are same lessons and some of them are slightly different lessons. And for natives here in the United States, uh, the, the surprise, the surprise of the colonialism practices. First, there was in certain areas, there was the um, a certain amount level of friendship and uh, camaraderie, and but there was also um, this uh, spirit of like acquisition, you know, of of uh, and the and the discovery that how rich this continent is, you know, the the rich different type of um, potential for crops and farming and then the potential for all the different animals and the minerals and so along with the progression of the industrial revolution you know we're just um uh we were pushed and we were pushed right almost from the outset pushed westward and so my people were originally in minnesota and got pushed out onto the plains and I don't think most people realize that we were only out on the plains for maybe 200 years. I mean, it was not that long, but because of our um, tie with closeness to earth, we were able to be uh, befriend the Buffalo nations really. So we have a really strong tie. The plains people, not only Lakota, but Cheyenne, the Crow, lots of tie to Buffalo nations. But that's kind of to illustrate uh, when you're close to earth 
and then you the animal spirits there's a befriending so buffalo was feeding us and clothing us and um, housing us in our teepees and giving us our ceremony and part of our spirituality uh, but part of our um, spirituality which is um, tied to all spirituality is we discover you know that the basis of all these different traditions are unity so uh, we recognize you know our tie to the star nations and a lot of our ceremonies had to go into secret and uh, thank heavens that there were some many actually they were able to keep some of the songs and some of the ceremonies and those are coming forward now uh, I was I had the really the great honor from 2015 to 2018 for it to, to help sponsor the horse dance ceremony to come back to my tribal lands and uh, for the healing of the women and the children. But as far as the recognition of our people, we faded and were faded into like into the background and and what happened to us has been suppressed and uh, i guess there's been a romanticization romanticization of 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 what's happened so that historically we're seen in one perspective but now in the modern time we are uh, mostly forgotten and and most people don't even there are a lot who don't even realize that there are reservations in the united states and rancherias and and some of the places that those reservations are put are very um poor there's no work and there's the the um drug and alcohol rates and suicide rates are just phenomenal still so there is this great i guess you would call it shadow of suppression within native communities um, those native communities that are near big, huge um, populations, they have had, they have casinos. So the casinos have allowed for a certain amount of financial uh, growth and, and strength, but the spiritual strength, yes, great spirit is, is waking up in all of our communities, but the relations between the United States governments, the state governments is still so weak. And many of our children are being stolen by the social service system still, taken away. Um, the prisons are populated, you know, with so many of our, our native people. The racism in the towns next to the reservation is still very, very prominent and uh so there's still this huge amount of work to be done and personally myself my own personal journey has come through this shunning i mean i was as a, a four and five year old in in this the white public schools i did not get played with no uh and i i didn't know i was anything different i mean i I didn't identify myself as a Native American. I was just a little girl. So it took me many years to discover, oh, they didn't play with me because I was American Indian. And, uh, and then uh, my mother left my father and married a white man from the South. And so in encountering the violence in the home of, of it was, and the, and the alcoholism was there so i've been brought on this huge healing journey and uh and it's brought me to this great service now all these dreams and all these visions and all these healings that i've had bringing more and more wisdom and more and more courage and healing my heart and so that i know this path that as we grow with our spiritual connection that it brings us wisdom and then also the courage to come forth to serve in this way and how am i doing on time <laughs> would you be able to let me know how i'm doing on time then please 
I know this is a surprise. You have seven minutes, and I was going to do this at five with the feather, and then this at two. Oh, okay. so I have more time. Work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I have so I have at least five more minutes. Okay. Wow. I'm I'm doing good about learning how to kind of condense things pretty well, but um, so the, some of the things I think that we need now are some way to get people to talk to one another. What I see that colonialism has brought is this hierarchical structure where the masses, the masses of humanity, not just in the United States, but all over the world, are, are think of themselves as so denigrated. And, and then everybody is kind of looking up to, you know, these different great leaders, this kind, this kind of thing, and which is totally, this, this needs to be corrected, this whole belief system, and then all of the habits and all the ways we think of ourselves as being less than someone other. And so that's why I know that this type of thing, where people can just come together and be real, you know, that we're, we're, we're real together. And, and with, with this heart knowledge and this reaching out and trusting that trust begets trust and this love and the tenderness, this tenderness begets tenderness. And because the trust is broken, the trust is broken so many ways within our, inside of ourselves and inside of our families, and then into these societies. And so our social justice system re reflects this. And I'm so thankful we have uh, Clevia here. I think we'll be able to talk more about that. But there needs to be a whole process of opening communication. And I think Clovid, Co Clovid. <laughs> maybe there's a Clovid, our Clovid ancestors are here too from this nation. <laughs> but COVID is really like illustrating, you know, not only this is pushing us further and covering our mouths, and it's exactly the opposite that we need to be doing. But it's reflecting, it's reflecting to us where we are. And, um, and we're discovering now that the COVID virus, the, the newest research is in fact that COVID would come, it's gone through the, it goes through the air, it's carried on the winds, and it's part of a, a process of how our whole earth for millions of years has used viruses to help propagate evolution itself. And, um, and what I'll do is uh, post some links to the most uh, current research to illustrate what, the, what I'm talking about on this. So um, I feel like this is like, like a beginning. These kinds of talking circles need to be instituted. And so those of us who are participating here, you know, for this, and then, and then this is being filmed, thank heaven, so that this can go out and these kinds of messages can go out because uh, we humans are, we're so, we're, we're magnificent, we're magnificent, and we have the ability to participate in consciously with all the forces of creation and and we need somehow to touch one another so that we all can know this and not just the ones that are that are are the teachers or the ones that don't have access to um to a lot of these modern the modernism you know for communication so i feel like we've got to find ways for this to reach to the people, to all people. I mean, the great mother in me, it's like, no, we're not leaving anybody out. We're, this is the in-gathering. We're, we're reaching out to everybody. So, so with that, I'd like to pass this talking time onto my beloved sister, whom I used to, we, we, we were brought together by spirit and we were roommates for a while. Mutima. Mm. Thank you.
And let me say thank you for the wisdom that has been delivered through you. And I also want to thank everyone who is here. Um, I really believe that the time is now for exactly what we're doing. And that is so exciting to me. It is so exciting that we're bringing the sacred into the conversation around justice and around racism. And it is so important for each one of us to know that we signed up for this at this time to be here. So each of us has um, some responsibility and can be accountable for the way that we reimagine and reformulate the future for our generations to come. And so I want to talk to you about uh, colonization because it is the thing that has caused racism to uh, be a spoken word in everybody's mouth and um, a constraint, a ball of chain, a loose around many people's necks, especially African American people who are still being lynched in the United States today. So what's really important is for us to really begin to look at our history and our history, wherever we're living, is so important because if you don't know where you've come from, you will be confused about where you're going. So there's this bird called the Sankofa bird out of the African culture that says you have to look at the past in order to be a, have a clear pathway to the future. And those of us who are alive, we're in between our ancestors. So I'm going further back than just the history of the country, but the ancestors that we've all come from. And the because we live in the middle between the ancestors and the of future generations, it is our responsibility to uh, be accountable. So there's so many human atrocities. Um, I remember when Nelson Mandela got freed, he came to Oakland and I got to go to the Coliseum to hear him. And the first thing he said to the United States, Turtle Island, if you do not make amends with the indigenous people of this land who we live on, that was stolen from them. If you don't do that, you're just spinning your wheels, that that's the place to start. And so in the United States, um, there are some what we would call atonements that need to happen, some repents, some uh, forgiveness, uh, uh, reparations, all of that. And it is really because of white supremacy. So I'm going to give you a definition of white supremacy from a woman named Elizabeth Martinez. She says white uh, supremacy is a historical based institutionalized system of exploitation and, and oppression of continents, nations, and people of color by white people and nations of the European continent for the purposes of maintaining and defending a system of wealth, power, and privilege. So um, one of my mentors, may she rest in peace, Frances Cress Wellsling, said that her mentor said, if you do not understand white supremacy, what it is and how it works, everything else that you understand will confuse you. So oftentimes in a mixed crowd, when these words are spoken, a lot of resistance comes up. And I'm not talking about white people. I'm talking about an institutionalized systematic program that has been in place. And you know, when I'm with people and they say, well, you know, I'm not benefiting from it. I'm like, if you look at the history, 
there is this saying that says that if you are white, you're all right. If you are yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, you can stick around. And if you're black, get back. So there has been this demonization of people of darker you, people who call themselves black. And in the United States, we're at a crucial time and all over the world because people are, are um, protesting together that Black Lives Matter. And it took a police officer putting his knee on Mr. Floyd, George Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds for the world to finally say Black Lives Matter. And I just learned a couple days ago that the reason why it was such a shock and just tore everybody's heart open is because if anybody knows anything about hunting, when a hunter shoots an animal and goes over to the animal, he puts his knee on their neck until they stop breathing. And so what is so inspiring now is to really hear that we don't want to treat Black folks like animals. And so when we look at the history, instead of the United States just saying, yes, we went to get um, Africans and brought them over and enslaved them to build this country. And now that they're free, they can be equal. They made up this concept called race. White race. And there's a whole, um, it's history. So you, if you're really interested in, you can go look at the uh, Baker's Rebellion because indigenous, indigenous white I didn't say that word right. Indigent, indigent servants that were white got with the African slaves and they rebelled together. And then the white aristocrats realized that they were not going to win this combination of poor whites, uh, poor people from other European countries working with the Africans that they were too powerful, that they were going to be overthrown. So the aristocrats said, oh, to the poor whites, well, you're like us, you've got the skin color. They gave them some land and they made them the overseers of the slaves. So this is all documented. This is the problem about colonization. We only know what they've told us and they haven't told us the truth not about any of our history, really. So the contributions of history uh, from all cultures needs to be rewritten. And I think that the, when you look at the progression out of slavery, there came the Jim Crow laws, and there's a wonderful book called The New, the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, who talks about the fact that Black people were even more endangered after slavery because in slavery, they were a piece of property. And if somebody came and wanted to kill you, the master would say, that's my property, leave them alone. But after slavery, any person white person who wanted to lynch a black man for whatever reasons, because he was doing too well or that he might have looked in the way of looking where a white woman was, it was full game. So there's another book called The Warmth of Many Sons, S-U-N, and it talks about the great migration of uh, African-American people out of the South. And a lot of them left in the middle of the night with nothing because they knew that they were going to be lynched. And so there's a history of violence in the United States. And there's a book called My Grandmother's Hands. And that book talks about black body pain, white body pain, and blue body pain. 
and the blue body is police pain. So what we see in the United States, and we're at a pivotal moment when we're looking at how can we look at the justice system and make it fair. And this whole concept about defunding the police is really about rewriting history. It really is about looking at the moral injury that Black people have because the people who are supposed to be protecting the community kills us instead of protects us. So the criminal justice system in the New Jim Crow, there was this law that if you were Black and standing on the corner, a white person could come up to you and say, show me your work papers. And if you didn't have work papers, they would arrest you as citizen arrests, take you to the courthouse. And if you didn't have enough money in your pocket to pay the person who brought you there, the clerk and the judge, you would be sold or a corporation would buy you and then you would have to, they would pay your fine and you would have to go work uh, at these uh, factories. So the, there is this shocking awareness of how systematic oppression actually exists. And in the United States, there have been laws, housing laws, lending laws that have said, that has excluded people um, of color. And so it's really important for us to begin to practice forgiveness. And that's my piece. Like, I forgive you, America my brother who has fallen out of grace into sin. I forgive you for the bodies burning, backs being beaten, mothers crying, babies dying. I forgive you and I take back my power. So we can never talk about injustice and the trauma of racism and an injustice uh, system without talking about the resilience of the people. So with all of the horrific things that have happened, you see people wanting just to have peace, just to have a life where you don't have to be persecuted because you're living by black, being black or left on the reservation forgotten about because we're so ashamed of our history. So in all of my work, I really know that this is one of the hardest conversations. This is one of the hardest conversations to have, but this is one of the most important conversations. If we do not tell the truth about the things that we think are secret, and they're not secrets, everybody knows on some level, it runs into our bodies. White folks who came to the Turtle Island to make a new life came from horrific trauma and brutalization. And instead of metabolizing their trauma, and this is from the book, My Grandmother's Hands, they, they didn't metabolize their trauma. They blew it through the indigenous people, native people, and then they, did, they blew it through the people that they enslaved. So that trauma lives in each of us. My people's trauma of being slaves lives in me. Edgeness people, her blood lives in her. It lives in all of us. So the first place to really start to think about how do we create a, a place for more resilience is to face the trauma of our history and to do some atonement. There are, there are, uh, it's time for reparations. The uh, Japanese people got reparations, the, the Jewish people got reparations. It's time for black folks to get reparations. And if there's any resistance to that, it's the resistance because we have had centuries centuries of looking at the color black and demonizing it. And the concept of black people being dangerous, aggressive, 
uh, evil, savages, ignorant, all comes from that one concept of looking at black as negative. So I say that we have a tipping point opportunity and that tipping point opportunity is to be able to say black is beautiful and to know that the black sky allows the stars to shine, that the mother's womb is dark and that's when birth is. So we need to reprogram, recolonize ourselves, decolonize ourselves so that we can come out of the mental constraints that say, if you're white, you're all right. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're brown, stick around. And if you're black, get back. We don't need any more detention centers for our brown sisters and brothers, taking them from their children like it's okay. Why weren't we enraged in that? We don't need any more juvenile halls for young black and brown kids. And what's it gonna take? Do they have to come out off after the white kids in order for it to happen? No, we say we're stopping it now and we're doing it together. The world is unifying and saying and wanting to hear, and I'm willing to say it, I forgive you. Please forgive me. I am sorry. I love you and thank you. So in order to have this very tough conversation, there are some ground rules. And one of them is to be in either or thinking. In order to have a deep conversation about these things, we have to be able to hear people who don't think the way that we think. So we have to get out of either or thinking because either I'm right and you're wrong or I'm wrong and you're right. And we need both and. We need to be able to breathe through the pain of hearing something. And if anything that I have said caused any blame, shame, or guilt, breathe through it because that's not what I'm here for. And anytime those emotions come up, we get stuck and we stop listening it is really time to do some deep listening. And then the other thing in the talking circle, um, it's all right to be uncomfortable. Use your breath to breathe through it. And I think my time is about up, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sister. It was beautiful. We love Clivia. I would like Talking us to stick Yeah. I would like us to start with a moment of silence after what we heard, to just let sink the words in that we've heard. My sisters talked about the trauma of their people on the American continent over the last 500 years and just drop inside and just feel how it feels to have heard this truth, this very important conversation. Just allow yourself, how does it make you feel? What does it bring up in you in this moment? And can you allow all these feelings to be here and be open for a little journey back to Europe? It feels like we are going the other way around this time. 
who am I to talk after these pearls of wisdom of my sisters? I was born in Hamburg, north of Germany, the country that has brought so much pain on the whole world. Within only 12 years, in a very effective German manner, almost 6 million Jews have been killed because they were Jewish. That was the only reason. Almost 55 millions of people all around the world have died in World War II only because there were some people in power in Germany thinking they were superior. And these numbers are just unimaginable. And every human being that lost his life is too much. Every single human being that lost his life is too much. No human being has the right to take another human being's life. We are the same. We have the same desires. We are running from the same negative feelings. Where are we today, 2020? Let me just share a little bit from my country in researching on where punishment came from. I realized punishment and prisons are very young, very young babies actually. The country I was born to, they were Germanic tribes before the Romans Christianized that area of the world. And in this Christianization, we lost our indigenous traditions, rituals, our connection to the land. What I found really interesting, I just read it a couple of days ago, the land didn't belong to the people, the land belonged to the community in the Germanic tribes. And how did punishment work? Yes, there was blood revenge. I think every community knows blood revenge. I think this is the first impulse of human beings. If you have lost something, if somebody has hurt you, you wanna hurt back. But that's the first impulse. And it's up to all of us to not follow this impulse because we all are human beings. We have this in us. I really want to bring the attention back to us. And then besides blood revenge, there were always, in all indigenous cultures, there was always a system of peacemakers, of a system of paying money, making reparations trying to make up for what has been hurt, has been taken away, has been destroyed. And in the 12th century, punishment was born because societies in Europe grew bigger. There was competition for land and people wanted to have power over other people. And in order to have power over, they had to be higher. And to make themselves higher, others had to be less. And in this moment, the sovereignty was lost. And in these times, I'm so happy to see how so many people are standing up, taking back their sovereignty, saying, we are equal. Black lives matter. This is the slogan of our times. Indigenous lives matter. Let me come back to Germany in the last century. After the war, the United States, Britain, France, and Russia stayed in the country for a couple of years to make sure that this is never going to happen again in Germany. And they helped us build up a very strong democracy built on the rule of law and especially on human dignity. Our first basic law, our constitution, says human dignity is the most important value. And I, am, I, I do believe that we have managed to bring human dignity to a very important place. And we have challenges, but we are in a good way. There is the sensi sensitivity in Germans of how quickly something can turn in a very ugly way. It took Germany 20 years to 
really face the Nazi past. End of the 50s, trials took place dealing with the atrocities that happened in concentration camps. The Auschwitz trial, the most important trial happening from 63 to 65, took place in front of a German regional court in Frankfurt. The sentences were prison sentences. Ridiculous, seven years of imprisonment for hundreds, thousands of people who have been killed by these people, but you, have to, you had to prove. But the symbolic importance of these trials were that Germany itself, German judges, were judging on other Germans having taken part in this mass killing machinery. A lot of money has been paid to Jewish people who have lost their lives. We have a lot of memorials. The concentration camps today are memorials. And yes, there are still some buildings that belong to the state and sometimes there's buildings that are reused for administration, I think even prisons, but I'm not quite sure. So there is always the struggle with history, but what happened, the, the, the main thing of these trials is that a lot of historical reports were used in the trials and are still until today the basis of historical research on what happened in the concentration camps on how was the structure, the command, the, the chain of commands. And this is taught in the schools. Like we learn about Nazi times again and again and again and what, what happened before and how it led into the Nazi period and how so many people voted for Hitler. How it's not only, there was not only Hitler and his few people who were put on trial in Nuremberg. The whole country loved Hitler with some exceptions. So we have faced that part of our history and we are still facing it. But for me, the lesson from Auschwitz, the lesson from that time is to look who are the people who are oppressed now who are the people who are not treated as equal who are the people who get arrested first who get thrown into prison and who go in there and to support them and protect them this is what i think is the lesson that we are still learning to this day. And then again, my feeling is in the Western world, there is such a giving all responsibility to the state, to the institutions, instead of staying sovereign. I wanna use this word again, it's so crucial, staying sovereign and being there for one another. That is so normal and natural to indigenous communities I've come across. We as people have to wake up that we are all equal and it starts with us. It starts where we are. And I find it very important, especially as a white person, to really look and really inquire, where do I have a racial tendency? And it starts with, where do I wanna be better than? Where do I wanna be more than? And not denying it, not, not wanting not to have it, but to just, oh, allow it to be there. This is, okay, this is where I'm at at the moment. And can I just sink into love and heal it where I am in this moment? And we need this conversation. Mutima, thank you for bringing it up and thank you for finding such direct, clear words. We need to talk about it. Trevor Noah, the host of The Daily Show, once said, one of the things he would like to bring to the States from South Africa is that in South Africa, we talk about racism. We've had the Truth Commission. It's been out there. It's been painful. But we can talk about racism. And then he quotes in the States, if you talk to white Americans saying something about slavery, like, oh, I'm not responsible. No, it's not that you're responsible, but it's part of the history. So I think the United States need a federal Truth Commission First, that brings up all these stories of pain that has been in, has been caught, has happened to people of African American ancestries, but also to indigenous people whose land has been taken and who have been 
put onto reservations with which land was not very useful for the white men. So this is the first part of a truth commission that would be needed to bring, bring up the stories that people can share their stories. One of the things that, that touched me most when I was interning at the truth commission, went to my first human rights violation hearing in Craddock in the Eastern Cape of South Africa was an old lady. And she started her statement in Kosa. I still can't really pronounce it correctly. And she said, thank you for inviting me. Merely in letting me tell my story, how my grandson was killed for being at the wrong time, at the wrong place, I get back my human dignity. And the sentence has been with me ever since 1997 when I interned. Telling my story gives me back my human dignity. In my courtroom, I just thought of the sentence, how often do we not give victims the space to share their story and do not give them back their dignity because they are just a witness and we just use them to get the truth. So this is one pillar, giving victims the space to talk. So slavery has been hundreds of years ago, but what is the impact today? Let the, the people who have lost a loved one through police violence tell their story, how it affects them to this day. It needs to get out, it needs to get hurt, it needs to be on the news every day. In South Africa, five minutes of every day's news at seven o'clock, eight o'clock, five minutes truth commission report. What happened? Pictures. You saw the picture of a police officer who had testified on the amnesty committee that day. What he said, what he did. In South Africa, that was the second pillar in South Africa, perpetrators could get amnesty if they gave full disclosure. So you had these men telling what they did. And this is how a lot of incidents that came to light, families wanted to know where the bones of their beloved ones were, that they could finally bury them. And all they wanted when the Truth Commission asked them, what do you want? How can we help you? All most of Black South Africans wanted was the truth and the money for a tombstone that they can have a place to go to and to remember their beloved ones. And this is, this is huge. What I see missing in the Western system with us white people is this willingness, this capacity to forgive. But this is human, we are all human beings. We all make mistakes and we have the capacity to forgive. And Mandela, Nelson Mandela has shown it. He was thrown in prison for 27 years and he came out and was an icon of forgiveness. And Tutu said he needed his years in prison to soften and to work off his anger. So whatever your life story is, you have the capacity to forgive. I'm coming to an end, I see the sign. Forgiveness will set you free and you're not forgiving for the other, you are forgiving for yourself. I wanna end my talk with Eva Kor, who survived Auschwitz and in 1995 decided to forgive the people who killed her family and so many others in Auschwitz. And after that, she said, forgiving is like chemotherapy, you do it for yourself. Forgiving was an act of self-empowerment, of self-healing. I was no longer a victim of Auschwitz. I was finally free. Thank you for the, the invitation to join your panel. I'm just deeply honored. And I give the talking stick back to you, Edna. Thank you. So we have now the time for talking circles and we're blessed with only 14 people. So we can have maybe three talking circles, two talking circles, one talking circle. So I need to have kind of a, a vote about how you feel because talking circles create an intimacy, but 
there, there's such an intimacy here right now. It can, it can really, it's present. But um, I'm wondering about whether we want to all stay together or we want to break out into two or three groups. So I think we might have to poll more than we have 10 minutes till the top of the hour uh, because their goal that from my perspective was so powerful. And um, for me as one of the presenters and facilitators, um, one of the very key points is about the listening and stories being told, finding ways for this to happen. That there is a collective process that needs to happen. There does need to be an overhaul of the justice, the economic, the educational systems, and uh, just let's see, justice, economic, educational, and so with with that, it, to me, it seems like there's a like a reform for humanity, and that the Shalania was bringing this in and this what we started this with is that the sacred is actually inclusive of the great range of our consciousness our spirit uh, there might be lots of ways of talking about this but that's what we're really doing is inviting you know the fact that we do have dreams we do have visions we do have clairvoyance we have uh, our, and our ancestors, we have all these levels of our being that we're calling in now to work with us and to be with us because we are such magnificent, wondrous, wondrous, sacred beings. And we have this ability to <laughs> become now the family of humanity. I mean, this is what's really, we're, what's, we're really being called for this. And then, and then to become the family with with our Earth, our Earth Mother, and Mutima was eloquently talking about being able to turn and join with the the messages and the teachings of Earth through the plants, the animals, um, the rocks, the minerals, the springs. Lot, I mean, we have so many relationships across so many cultures of relationship with with earth in all these different ways so uh, that's that's sort of what i'm gathering and then the other thing is that we absolutely brother phil and i are talking about instituting uh talking circles and i would want to call them like sacred talking circles or sacred space circles for for um sacred dialogue. I mean, uh, you know, uh, maybe there's some other terms that we need to um, come in, bring in so that it could be um, more, so it doesn't put, push people away. We want to bring people in. So, uh, but that's something that we'll have to discern, you know, as this, uh, as we think about doing this, to in, instituting this in various ways, and that, it, that we're global. I mean, we're already global with this this discernment and this um, talking to your circle leadership program and Unity Earth, uh, Unity Week, so that we're already touching each other in global ways so that we can really spread this, whatever, all the inspirations. So I've said my little piece, if Mutima and um, Clivia, please, for, for what this has brought for you. You are muted, Mutima. We can't hear you. I just w wanted to say I appreciate the opportunity to be a part. And um, thank you all for coming. I think it is important to speak our uh, truth into the ethers. And uh, I, I believe that it's like spreading seeds in a garden so thank you so much for all that you have 
uh, said and, um, and thank you for showing up. Ms. Clivia. Yes, I'm, I just can say that my heart is filled with gratitude and love and grace. And some of you know me, I love silence. I would just love to spend this a little moment with all of you just in silence to just feel the group energy and letting the seeds sink in and what we've shared in small and in big groups. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are complete. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Oops.